it is this. yeah it has started okay uh, so welcome all uh, this is uh, the third uh, alumni meet uh, session and uh, we are once again having uh, somebody a chemical engineer from uh, 2016 batch now uh, contrast to what we began with the 2016 batch uh, on the day one of uh, alumni meet so this is sundar uh, ramaswamy uh, who after his btech year as i said uh, went abroad uh, to us did his petrochemical engineering and is also now working uh, i'm not going to take much time but i would definitely like to share one thing uh, to all the uh, juniors there about sundar uh, even on the very first uh, year of his uh, graduation i mean very first year of his study at shastra uh, he was the only one from his class who attended uh, the cape and he used to sit in the second row of auditorium where you have this uh, red color chair okay the first two rows used to be like red color chair right he used to sit alone and he used to listen to the talks we were wondering who is this boy who looks very timid and why he has come <laughs> so that's that's sundar and all through his four years uh, i think i have seen him probably in the uh, in the second and third row i'm not saying he's studious guy he's mischievous guy but uh, he knows how to take things <laughs> uh, sincerely or seriously along with his uh, other uh, uh, friends so that's uh, that's one thing i want to tell at least before i formally start the title itself is very chuck because it's uh, ms in us and es put an hyphenated word of 101 now i really am waiting to hear what this 101 he wants to convey uh, so there would be lot of juniors in the final year second year and the third year uh, i mean third year we have to now write probably gate uh, or gre or tofil now in this next uh, july august hoping to go for higher studies and for second years it's a little long term goal we have to uh, plan little ahead so if you have seen the write up uh, sundar himself has told he was slightly more focused of a person probably from his class that uh, right from his third year uh, he had made up his mind that he has to do an ms abroad and that's why he channelized uh, his uh, time uh, during his studies so i think uh, third years and uh, second years can have a lot of inputs and obviously the final years you can know at least you are about to graduate but you can know what to do what not to do Uh, when you land uh, in US, so feel free to chat, uh, uh, type your questions in the chat, and I think Sundar can simultaneously go through it and uh, take it up. So thanks, Sundar, uh, for coming forward and uh, giving this, and uh, you can take it forward. I'm just closing my share, so you can open if you want to show anything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh... first of all thanks to narayan sir and uh, the student chapter for uh, taking up this initiative and uh, giving me an opportunity to talk to you guys so first let me start off by explaining why this 101 uh, it's just uh, any course in the us any introductory course that you take in the us has a course code of 101 so the basic idea of this talk is to give you an introductory uh, introduction basically to ms in us so what you need to be doing and uh, so it's nothing so much ding chuck like uh, sir told but uh, yeah so it's just to give you a brief idea uh, about the whole process what it looks like and i want to share some of the things like maybe i had if i had known this better like before prior to doing this i might have planned better so okay i hope uh, i don't know how many of you are in second year and uh, third year here from this uh, group of 20 people or so uh so for who like sir said for people in second year this is little bit early does anybody have their recording mic on or okay yeah so it might be too early for somebody from second year but you can always uh, plan ahead and uh, this is just to give you an uh, give you one perspective about what to do so basically i joined chemical by by chance i did not want to do i did not take it up wanting to do chemical i actually wanted to do, uh, do mechanical engineering so but i did not get that uh, so when i when i got chemical engineering i took it up and my first aim was that okay after first year i'm going to slide 
and as you all know uh, to slide in sastra you need a 9 gpa which which was not to be so after first semester i realized that no i'm not going to be sliding and hence i wanted to take this up more seriously and that's why i was there at kp in my first year also just to get an idea of uh, uh, the whole department and stuff and and uh, the point when i decided that i want to do masters was actually uh, this is not to sugar coat things just because narayan sir is here or anything but uh, fluid mechanics was actually a turning point for me when i started to take this up more uh, seriously and i was focused after fluid mechanics and few more courses in in my fourth and fifth semesters i knew that this is what uh, i want to pursue i want to do my masters either in chemical or an extension of chemical that's why i ended up doing my masters in petroleum engineering which is more focused on upstream oil and gas exploration so the first step is like for you to decide you want to do ms and the common question is that do we write gate or do we write uh, gre and go abroad so i i can give you an idea about uh, both but more focused on ms because i have been i i did that so for me uh, for gate you need to be you need to prepare a little more than for gre and uh, i think both of them have their own advantages and disadvantages so if you take up uh, there are like lot of high, top institutes even in india which provide a really good coursework really good research and have great faculty for chemical engineering and uh, i am proud to say that sastra is one of a good good departments for undergrad at least in chemical and i had a chance to interact with lot of chemical engineers from various other top institutes in india and i i i truly believe that we are also right up there with them uh, at no point i felt that they had any competitive edge over me or anything like that so that that's something that you all must keep in mind and you must be proud to be in sastra chemical department so coming comparison between uh, gre and if you see gate gate you need to prepare more dedicated and you need to know and for gre also for many people it depends on financials if are you ready to spend this 30 lakhs or 35 lakhs whatever the minimum coursework amount that you are going to spend on your masters and are you uh, comfortable in your family situation and everything you need to take care of all that it's just not that okay i want to go abroad i want to get out of india you might think it's it's easy life in the us is easy but uh, it's it's really not it, it it's no cake walk it can be challenging and uh, so you need to be sure that financially are you ready to do this take this decision first of all that matters a lot even if you're going to take an education loan uh, you need to be sure that getting a job here is not very easy so it might take you a while after graduation maybe 6 months maybe one year to get a job and whichever country you are applying to always know their immigration policies this was something that i did not know a lot and i wish i wish i had known more about this because the immigration policies in countries can be complex and uh, in especially in the us right now it's just, it's getting really stringent for immigrants it's it's really hard especially if you are a first generation immigrant from your family it's it's going to be hard uh, so you need to know all this and there are advantages that you get the coursework here is good and there is there is no excuse that you don't have the resources you always have all the resources that you need and if you if you are just ready to apply yourself and if you are focused you have all the resources that you need here to do whatever you want in excel so this you need to be these are things that you need to keep in mind basically and for me uh, when you so if you have decided that you want to do masters especially if you want to do it in the us right now many countries like canada their immigration policy is a little more lenient compared to us but you you never know it it's it's today it's that way but it could change the next year uh, always keep in mind that you are an immigrant in any other country that you go to you are always an immigrant and it's not going to be easy for you uh, so okay so there is one question okay this i will try to answer little later uh, uh so yeah once you have made up your mind that you want to pursue ms in the us or any other country you need to give gre toefl or ielts or any of these exams yes they are easy compared to gate but they also need uh, preparation you need to prepare at least for 3 4 months dedicatedly and 
that's that's when you are going to get a good score and you also need to have a good profile like you need to have a decent gpa uh, it's not everything that it's not the only thing that matters but it uh, it does matter too so yeah in case you are a third year and you think you have a low gpa it's not it's you don't have to really beat yourself over it you can always uh, try to make up for it with your gre score or do some good projects and build your profile strengthen it in other places some colleges in the us they they see a gpa a lot they focus on gpa so if you have over 9 you apply otherwise you don't there are colleges like that but uh, there are some which are okay with you having a moderate gpa but uh, uh, also a good gre score and overall uh, profile must be a little strong and your sop is also another thing that matters uh, in india i mean at least what i faced was you know you just treat everything as a part b question in your uh, semester exam and you write three pages even though it it does not contain anything related to the question you still write three pages but uh, that's what even i did initially uh, regarding sops you need to try and keep it short and focused on what you want to convey what is it that you want out of this college and what is it that you are applying for and you, it needs to be more focused it cannot be very vague and just trying to fill up pages so these are the things and me i think i wrote my uh, gre when i was in 6th semester i guess uh, the day i got placed in mu sigma actually i got a placement offer from mu sigma and that was the day when i registered for my gre exam until then i was still uh, confused if i want to work or no but when i got my job uh, ironically i was clear that i did not want to do it so i wanted to pursue this i that was the same exact date when i booked my slot for gre and I, two months later i gave it and then it once you give your gre and once you have always give yourself some time to have even a second attempt this was something that i did not do i felt i was maybe 3 or 4 months late into giving my gre exam had i given it earlier maybe i had chance to give it again to boost up my score if uh, if, if that's the case if at all you want to do it in your first attempt it's not always that you get a really good score in your first attempt so always give yourself some time to be able to give a second attempt of this and also have enough time for the whole application process because once you're done with your gre you need to start selecting the universities that you want to apply to and this can always be tricky so it's like walking into a candy store and and you look at all the candies you want everything but uh, what people do usually is they look at various universities and all the different courses that they offer and try to choose what they want from that but i feel you should start from within you should start from within yourself what you need you need to be clear of note down write it down on a paper and know that this is what you want to do Th- these are your requirements from the course and this is what you want to get back from this course so once you are clear with that then you look for courses from universities that satisfy your criteria don't go looking for all the courses and then try to see what you like that that will be too confusing and you will end up wasting a lot of time on that so start from within once you are clear with what you want what course you want and you can you can go and for me this decision was uh, i was actually confused between pursuing a masters or a phd in chemical because i had offers from two uh, two schools to do a direct phd in chemical and also i had I had applied to some universities for petroleum so once i got my admit i had to decide between petroleum or chemical the thing is all chemical engineers we can be petroleum engineers but all petroleum engineers cannot be chemical engineers so so for me i was uh, interested in oil and gas just because how the world is crazy about this oil and i just wanted to see what is what is so fascinating about this how is it est- extracted what is exploration what is the production what is the process of getting this out into the market so that fascinated me and fortunately i had a admit from a good school university of houston which is houston is like the oil capital of the world so every major oil producing company has their headquarters in houston so that uh, for me was a no brainer and i decided to go ahead with my masters in petroleum so now answering hari haran's question the world is trying to move their sources of energy from petroleum to renewable and hydrogen is it safe to get into petrochemical industries under current scenarios so there is a difference between petrochemical industries and petroleum engineering as such because petroleum engineering deals with 
getting this crude exploring and finding out where this crude is there how much is there and how do you drill wells to take this out how do you produce this what are the facilities that you need to produce this crude and will you be able to do it at with the ongoing oil price will you be able to break even or make make good profit is it economically viable the, this is what petroleum engineering is and petrochemical is like once you get this crude you refine it and with all the other products what what else can you make with that that is more of downstream and there is a part of midstream which is which is like how once this crude is uh, taken out from from the surface like from the bottom and you need to be able to move this crude to the production facilities so downstream acts as a link between midstream acts as a link between upstream and downstream so this is basically what and at this point uh, yes the world is trying to move into renewable and but i feel that for the next 30 or 40 years at least the demand for oil is not going to go down and contrary to the belief that many people say okay we are not going to have enough oil we are going to have a lot of oil so there is already a lot of oil in place which has not been produced and we are going to have at least for one more gender two more generations at least and uh, safe to say that your career it it's not going to happen that there is a shift it is going to slow down but oil might become a priced commodity but it is not going to die down as a as an energy source because i don't i don't see that any aviation industry is able to function without crude or right now transportation industry in countries like the us where people depend largely on uh, road so roadways is a huge way of transportation and many people depend on this in the us so at this point there is no truck or anything that can go long distances like cross country which is which is electrically powered so that has not yet come i'm not going to say that it's not going to happen it is going to happen sometime down the road but it's going to take some time at least at least 10 20 years and that in itself will not replace oil completely because you still have aviation industry you have many industries that require oil and your plastics your fertilizers everything that comes from by products of oil so it's not going to die down completely yes it is going to not be as lucrative as it was before when when oil price was 120 dollars a barrel it's not going to be the same but but it's going to pick up but the only thing with this industry is that once you choose there is a lot of ups and downs so it's a cyclical industry and once because it's cyclical whenever the oil price is down your job may be at risk you don't know i have a lot of friends uh, uh, i have a lot of friends that who if they get a call from their manager today they just assume they're being laid off so it's that bad at this point because right now the oil price is say 27 dollars a barrel for wti crude so that's that's too less and because of this companies are uh, laying off people there is like huge layoffs going on and everybody at this point is scared but when it picks up it's going to be it's going to be okay but you need to be you need to be you know you have to accept the fact that you are in this cyclical kind of an industry once you are in upstream petroleum so you need to be ready if you can position yourself and make yourself valuable in your company by the time this downturn happens then you don't give them any reason to take you out so that way you have some kind of a job security so it always depends on the way you perform and uh, that's what it is so yeah and there is a question from shrinivas and i'm planning to write my gre in eighth semester how can this be advantages or disadvantages when compared to writing it in sixth semester okay uh in eighth semester there is no disadvantage like actually i feel at this point if you are able to land a job a core job or something some a job that is related to what you aspire to do in your masters then i would always advise that work for two years get relevant experience and then build on that to a masters if you are motivated enough if you think that once you go to work and once you earn some money you can still stop that and go back to studying i don't know if everybody can do that but if you can do that that's also a good thing to do so there is no really there's not much disadvantage in giving your gre in the 8th semester but there's going to be a lot of time in between now and when you start your coursework so try to utilize that time in doing something relevant to your coursework try to gain some professional experience relevant to what you are going to be studying something like that so if you can do that then i don't think there is any disadvantage to applying in 8th semester it's never too late so you can always even work for 2 years and then 
decide to give your GRE. But but when you do it, like prepare seriously, and all the time that you have in between giving your GRE and starting your uh, course, try to use it in a way where you can build something to relevant to your uh, masters that you'll be doing. So that's that's what it is. And yeah, so I was telling about yeah the whole process that choosing universities. Yeah, like I said, uh, choose from within. Uh, first, be clear what you want, and then go ahead and look at universities that offer courses and if it satisfies you. Don't go and look at all the courses given by universities and then try to see what you want. That that is just time waste. Uh, this is something that I did and I feel that was a mistake. So I was looking at courses from all all the universities and I felt like yeah I want to apply to this I want to apply to this also. And every application costs in dollars. So you have to balance out between applying. And when you have chosen your universities, always try to have a balanced uh, profile, uh, wherein you have like you know your GRE score and you know that these universities accept scores within this this range, and you know if this university is ambitious for you or you know that you are going to get it easily or it might be a moderate chance. So sort out universities based on that. Always have like two or three ambitious universities that you are applying to, and keep four or five of them maybe moderate and uh, uh, one some universities that you know for sure you're going to get an admit apply to two of them maybe one or even a couple of them that's that's good but uh, i applied to around eight or nine universities and uh, i got admit from five of them so i decided between those and all the five were like different courses i got some for petroleum i got some for masters in chemical i got some for phd in chemical so the these this was the thing that happened with me. So you need to be applying to at least eight or nine universities. It's, yes, it's going to cost you some money, but that's how you you know that, okay, you have a choice and you can choose between whatever you get because it's not like you apply to every university and you might get an admit. So try to keep this in mind always, uh, but never think that, okay, my score is too low, so I will not apply to some university where you're really interested in. But try to apply. It might be ambitious for you, but if your SOP is good, if you if they think that you can do it, they, if they think that you're a genuine candidate and they like your profile, they might give you an admit. You never know. But don't eliminate this. So keep two or three universities that way, uh, which might be too ambitious for you, but you you want to do it. You want to get in there if, if given a chance. So that's that's another thing. And yeah, so GRE is there, and then. TOEFL. So once you prepare for GRE, you might either give a TOEFL exam or uh, IELTS, depending on where you want to go. So majorly, if you want to be in the US, then it's going to be TOEFL. And for Canada, it's going to be IELTS. So uh, yeah, and TOEFL is basically just an extension of uh, GRE. More so like it has a lot of common stuff with the English, because TOEFL is just mainly focused on English. And once you're prepared for GRE, then you might just need to see what is the section wise difference, like what is specific about TOEFL that you just need to build on. Once once you're able to do that, yeah, then TOEFL is not not so hard. Uh, now that you've given your GRE, then TOEFL should not be so hard. So thing is, uh, yeah, so this application process, once you have chosen your universities, like I said, like a couple of ambitious ones and some where you know that you have moderately high chances of getting and some you know for sure you're going to get it so you apply to those as well and even uh, your references to these universities also matter many people don't take this too seriously but the references that you get from for these uh, universities matter and thankfully uh, for me people like narayan sir and gautam sir were gracious enough to fill out references for all the nine or eight or nine universities that i applied to and uh, it worked out. So you need to be able to get good references too. That is something that people ignore a lot, thinking that, okay, it's just another paperwork. But uh, people do look at it in a serious way here. So, okay, I have a question. Is there any strategy of getting a 100% scholarship in US universities? Hmm, there is no strategy as such. Uh, so if you want a 100% scholarship, it usually, usually it happens for uh, PhD courses. So there are chances that if you want to do a PhD in chemical, there are schools that offer you direct PhD. You can apply to a school, uh, a university, say, 
I know one university which does that. It's uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology. So if you can apply from with your bachelor's, they 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 give you an admit for a direct PhD. So if you're getting an admit for PhD, that's when you get hundred percent scholarship. So you get some. You are a teaching assistant or a research assistant, and you get some scholar. You get a monthly payment of say thousand dollars or thousand two hundred dollars. That should be enough for your uh, living expenses here, and. Plus, all your courses are free. So basically, the university or your professor's funding pays for your course. So that that is uh, that is the only way, I guess, you can get a hundred percent scholarship. But other than that, you might, if you're just doing a master's, if you're not doing a PhD, if you're doing only a master's, then it's hard to get a hundred percent scholarship. It's very rare that I know of. Uh, although you might get say fifty percent or sixty percent, depending on your university and. So for me, I had this after first semester. Based on your GPA, you could apply for this uh, teaching assistantship, and they would pick out people from all the applications, and they would hand out uh, teaching assistants uh, assistantships to you. So that comes with a fifty percent scholarship already, and you need to work as a teaching assistant for uh, undergrad courses. The courses. So basically, you are just uh, helping prepare lecture notes, helping prepare the exams, grading exams, and. Uh, helping out with students with their doubts and all that. Whenever the professor is uh, not available, you are even asked to take classes. So that's uh, teaching assistantship, or you get a research assistantship that you you request for to a professor uh, based on your interest. If he's doing some kind of a research on a field that you have interest in and you have some competency in that field, you can request this professor for a research as assistantship. And depending on how much funding he has. If, if he takes, if he decides to take you, then most of the universities, if you are a research assistant, then again you get fifty percent scholarship. But the only way I know of getting a hundred percent scholarship is direct PhD. And if you want to do that, yes, you can. You can apply to. You can look up to schools that offer this kind of direct PhD after your uh, bachelor's, and you can apply to those. So that's that's the only way for hundred percent scholarship. So. Yeah, so I have a question from Akash. Yes, if you're spending around thirty to fifty lakhs for higher studies, is it a good investment? Like, can we earn that back? Practical reasons. Yeah, I I get what you're saying. So it depends on your family situation. First of all, if you're able to spend thirty forty lakhs, uh, you might take a student loan or whatever it is, and it is a good investment because the learning experience that nobody can take away from you. That's for sure, and the learning experience here is definitely good. And if you are spending that much, uh, you will get it back. But you should not come with a mindset that I am here just to put in some money and take it back. It also depends on some stuff which is not tangible, like the learning, which is not really tangible. The, I mean, it cannot be ignored. So these are the things that you need to look at. Learning, nobody can take away from you. Whatever the experience that I have had here, two years of my master's coursework, it was worth spending that money. And money you will make more or less because if you're you're in a field like you're in chemical engineering, you're not going to make immediate money right out of school. So you need to be clear about that. The career growth is going to be slow, but it is going to be satisfactory. That's for sure. And uh, many people also think that okay, if you're doing petroleum, then you just make money right out of school. No, that's not true. And you need to be in the industry for at least four or five years before you really start seeing all the good returns. But thirty to fifty lakhs that you're spending on your education, you will get it back. But it's not going to be an instantaneous payback. It's going to take some time, maybe four years, maybe five years. But but I I definitely feel that it is worth it. But uh, you need to be sure. Uh, depends on what. This again also depends on the immigration policy of the country. So right now in the U.S., I don't know how many of you are aware of uh, the immigration policy here. So if you're doing a master's in the U.S., once you graduate, you have sixty days between your Day of graduation, uh, and you have sixty days to choose your start date of your OPT. This is called OPT. It is called Optical pra pra Practical Optional Practical Training, which is given to you at the end of your master's. So you have one year of this OPT, and if you have done a course based anything like a STEM course, which is science, technology, engineering, and management. Which most of you will definitely be doing if you're doing a master's in chemical. It definitely is is a STEM course, but many courses in management they don't come under STEM courses. So if you're doing a STEM course, 
you get OPT for one year and then you get an OPT STEM extension for two more years after this. So after this one year of your OPT, you can again apply for two more years, provided you have a job in the relevant field. So the first 60 days, say I graduated in August. So October was when I had to start my, the latest time I can, I can delay to start my OPT. So once I start my OPT, I have 90 days to get a job and I can only be unemployed for 90 days at the most. So you need to be able to find a job in short within like 90 plus another that 60 days. So that's 150 days after you graduate, which is not very easy all the time. So these are the things that I, I had not known previously. And for me, it turned out to be, I, I found a job within 30 days. So that was okay. But I know a few of my friends who are struggling to get a job even after almost the end of their period and they, they have not yet got jobs. So you need to be ready about all this. The thing is, once you get a job, you will you will be able to pay back this 30 or 50 lakhs, but it's not going to be instant. You need to be ready for that. It's going to take four or five years. You are in a core, core engineering field and you're not going to be making money like IT or computer science students right out of school. So that's that's for sure. So this this immigration policy, wherever you're going, whichever country you're going, in Canada, it's more relaxed. So you can get a PR by the time you graduate, you can get a permanent residency in Canada. And that that might ease a lot of pressure off people. In the US, it's not so easy. If you really want a green card in the US, today the, the wait period is around 99, 99 years on paper. If, if they speed up this process, you might be uh, able to get a green card in 25, 30 years, but that is if you're willing to settle here in the long haul. Uh, in contrast, Canada, by the time you graduate with your master's, you might have a PR. So it depends uh, what kind of, so that way you have less pressure and you have your permanent residency. So no one's going to send you out for not having a job. You can stay there. But yes, you will still have the financial burden of supporting yourself without a job until you find one. So that's there. There is another question from uh, Gundumala Shrikar. What happens if one doesn't get job within 90 days in the US? Yeah, so if you once your OPT starts, uh, once your OPT starts, you have 90 days uh, to get a job. If you don't get a job, on technically, you need to leave the country. But there are ways that people find uh like there are consultancies in the in the us that offer that you need to pay them some money uh, these are all like mostly indian consultancies you need to pay them some uh, money and they they might fake your payroll or whatever it is they might give you training in some departments and but, they'll... yeah but is it legitimate sundar uh this like on paper there is nothing illegal about it per se but uh, these consultancies are not there for chemical engineers, unfortunately. They are only there for, uh, say, IT and computer science. So there are few consultancies, one or two in the US for even for chemical engineers. But I would say that's not a very good uh, idea to do it. But that is what it is right now. Like, I don't want to sugarcoat anything so, for so, you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means uh, the direct answer for Shrikar uh, is uh, in 90 days, if you don't get, then get you out. You have to leave get out unless you are willing to do all this like and there are no, other ways like, do, yeah if you do all this and if you get caught then you are get caught for life yeah then you cannot come in anyways you'll they'll send you home only thing you don't have to book your ticket <laughs> so uh, yeah i mean you don't have to do all this but people in it many of them do this and this is one of the reason actually why the stuff it has become so stringent right now and yeah, within 90 days, you it's not always a sure thing that you will get a job, you will not get a job. But there is another way that you can do. If you have a good relationship with your professor or somebody, you can always start an OPT with your professor working as a research assistant or a teaching assistant in your college. And many colleges understand this, that within 90 days, it's sometimes impossible to get a job. So they take you as an employee. You are an employee of the college right now. After your graduation, you're still working on your OPT. and you are a teaching assistant or a research assistant for you can do that for as long as one year and within that one year you need to be able to find a job and then from OPT you need to move on to your OPT extension that is another two years and within these three years you 
need to the company that you are employed with they need to be able to apply for your h1b visa visa which is uh, so this year it, it's a lottery process and it basically depends purely on luck it's a lottery where so many people apply and they just pick out randomly uh, this year around 275000 people applied for this h1b and 85000 were only picked in this so and out of all these 275000 applications 68% were indians and 13% were chinese so 81% is just from india and china and uh, this uh, once once you are uh, if it gets picked which is a uh, you have three chances technically because you have three years after your uh, graduation which is one year of opt and two years of opt extension so within these three years you have three chances to apply for this lottery file for the lottery and if you are picked up in the lottery then they need to file your paperwork and uh, you if it all goes through fine yeah you should have your h1b so it is not easy uh, yeah. people uh, it is not easy but to all the people who are listening sundar is one lucky person oh, thanks yep uh, i mean yeah at this point yeah i feel lucky to have this because many of my friends have been saying that uh, they are struggling but also you should be in a mindset with like, okay uh, once you have studied here you got your education no one can take that back like i said and you should be willing that if you get a job say even in india or any other part of the world you should be willing to go and at this point i am even open to working in india so it depends on what you want from your career uh, money you will always make money later down the road but once you are starting your career you need to be able to be focused and know where you want to position yourself so that career path and career growth is more important than the money at least for the initial 5 years of your job that that is what i feel personally don't expect that once you graduate it's all going to be fine you know we have this mindset that oh you do well in your 12th standard your life is set and then you do well in your uh, gate exam or you do well in your gre then your life is set no but you just need to keep building it's a constant it's a continuous process you need to keep building on things so for me the main thing is a career growth and to answer sir's question you are good in academics but why not phd i'm sure uh, phd also are absorbed into industry okay so phd uh, they are absorbed into industry but again for phd if you are doing bachelors and then you do your masters and immediately you do your phd at this point you have zero work experience but you have a lot of academic experience and research experience with uh, with your phd and your masters but uh, as as such you don't have any work experience and you are too over qualified with a phd that companies might not be willing to pay you so much they don't because they have a policy that okay if they are taking a phd then this is what they need to pay him if they are taking a master student this is what they need to pay him many companies have this internal policy that they cannot exploit a worker like based on their qualification so for a phd they need to pay a lot at the same time you don't bring any experience with you except for your academic experience industrial experience is not there so many companies at this point they they are not willing to do that and for me particularly in uh, if it was chemical engineering i might i would have done a phd for sure but uh, in petroleum at this point with the market when when there is a downturn i did not want to enroll for a phd and come out uh, with no experience because petroleum is one uh, industry which they want your work experience more than academic and everything they want your hands on experience and that's why right now i'm working in the oil rig and uh, getting this experience so that i can build on that but uh, yeah so that that was the reason why i did not i did not move forward with my phd in uh, petroleum engineering my professor offered me a phd after i graduated uh, with masters but i just i thought about it and decided to take a call against doing a phd so there is another question with akash which countries you would suggest for higher studies apart from the us so right now canada is a really good option and there are a lot of good schools like uh, university of waterloo university of alberta and i'm sure we have a lot of uh, alumni from these schools who can also guide you right now canada is a good option i don't know for how long it's going to be the case so so far their immigration policy has been quite lenient and there are a lot of indians who are going there but over time when we start overpopulating this place and they realize that uh, you know we are taking away their jobs or something like that so that's when it's going to close down so right now i think canada is Uh, good australia is also pretty good people are going a lot of people are going to australia but 
i think canada is more lenient in terms of uh, immigration policy so at least if you have a status in that country a legal status and so you buy yourself some time to search for a job so that takes off some pressure uh, when you're searching for a job so canada for sure is a, a good option right now uh, excuse me so yeah so coming to the point that say you have decided everything you you have applied uh i have another question from narin sir what is the relevance of ug in your masters and in your current work in other words what technical and non technical should one focus or yeah for me uh like i said i really like fluid mechanics and thanks to narin sir for that uh and petroleum is more a lot of more about the basis is darcy's law and you're always talking about uh, flow through porous media so for me uh, the main part of my undergrad that i'm using is heat transfer mass transfer and fluid mechanics these three are the main main things that i use in petroleum engineering as a part of my job so i need to be able to understand the flow through porous media and any any petroleum reservoir say if it is 10000 feet deep you need to be able to understand that what is happening down there and when you produce some oil it is flowing into your well from at this point you need to know what is the frictional losses what is the drag is there any any flow flow assurance you need to be able to do flow assurance like there might be flow bo- blockages here and there so you need to be able to understand how this this whole process how is the flow of oil within the reservoir and from the reservoir to your well and from your well to your surface facilities so everything involves uh, basics of fluid mechanics heat transfer and mass transfer so these are the things that i use and and i would also like to stress on the fact that i think uh, maitre already told this yesterday and uh, I, i would like to stress on it again you need to learn some kind of modeling everybody should know a basic basic modeling principles they need to know some kind of a coding language either you you know scilab you know matlab or you know python or you need to know one of these coding languages it people think that okay i'm i'm a core chemical engineer i don't need to know it yes you don't need to know it very uh, to an extent how it works the deep down the code algorithm and all that but you need to know how to employ it as a tool you should be proficient that if you have a problem you need to be able to apply this tool to solve it so if you're that competent it's it's enough so for me i took keshe and that helped quite a bit and you would be surprised to know that there will be a lot of people uh, who have finished their bachelors and they don't know how to use the basics of excel too uh, i i think that should not be the case when you're trying to apply for your masters and you're trying to do some uh, research work with a professor or whatever you should know the basics of excel at least and one coding language one one programming language yeah. for sure yeah yeah sundar but uh, there is an unfortunate news now it is uh, no longer elective at your time cache was elective okay, okay. and now it's but compulsory I, papa, it is <laughs> compulsory elective course uh, uh, lab course it's a lab course sorry it's no okay. longer an elective course uh, it's a lab course uh, so it's uh, very That... unfortunate all have to go through the same uh, tutor <laughs> that's good because i still remember that uh, in cache and first caa i think i got 50 and because i did not write the roll number and name there that you wanted me the way you wanted it to be written i got a zero you gave 50 out of 50 and scratched it and wrote zero and i had to write the third ca for that i still remember that and even now after that every question paper i don't know if i read the uh, question or i read more about the instruction than the question because of this <laughs> so yeah i guess yeah it's a good thing that everybody has to learn uh, this coding and i'm sure keshe uh, you get good marks or no but you will learn for sure that that that's there uh yeah so the applicant i have another question which is so the application process for a direct phd is similar to that of an ms yes it is similar you just need to find out which college offers this course and you need to be, you need to apply to that program that's it everything else remains the same you need to have a gre score uh you need to have a toefl and you need to have all your documents that they require you to have and the application process is just the same uh, and some of the colleges if, even if you apply for a masters they actually suggest that we can even offer you a phd on their own 
I think this happened with the University of Pittsburgh or something. So there are many universities which do that too. But you can always look up on their program and there is an academic advisor for every program. You can always email them about any questions that you have even before applying and they, they usually respond to you within a day or two and they'll be able to solve all your questions regarding any specific thing that they have regarding the application process. But otherwise, it should all be the same. But uh, for PhD, it always helps if you have some kind of uh, research experience, uh, research experience relevant to what what PhD program you're applying to. And you should also be able to select, uh, see a few people in the department who are doing research to what you are interested in. And you can always get in contact with the professors before to applying also. And if the professor is really uh, impressed with your profile and is willing to just recommend you to the admissions department, then for sure you're getting an admit there. Uh, so that is also another good way to approach for PhD. And there is a question from Vignesh. Uh, since you have worked with a lot of companies like Shell and Exxon, do you think ONGC is on par with it? Also, could you elaborate briefly about the nature of your work? Uh, ONGC, unfortunately, so far is not yet on par uh, with many of the other operating companies in the world. Uh, in India, we only have like ONGC and Oil India Limited and Reliance, which are doing the majority of... Uh... Oh, <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> and yeah, in India, uh, you have just few uh, national oil companies like say ONGC and Oil India Limited. I, I worked with Oil India Limited on my master's thesis. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can say that they are not exactly on par with what uh, many operators in the world, leading operators in the world are doing. Uh, one is also because of funding. And even in India, it's not a country with a lot of oil resource that we have developed all our oil companies so much that they are competent with the world. But for India's production cap capability, I think ONGC and Oil India are doing pretty good. Uh, so about the nature of my job, yes. Uh, so I am into a service providing field. So. In oil and gas, there are operating companies that hold the leases, that own the land and own the mineral rights for that land, and they, they produce. So these are the companies that you have talked about, like Exxon or Shell. My company provides service to these companies when they are drilling for oil. So when there is a drilling, drilling operation going on, uh, you see, uh, it's like basically you're drilling a well. So you are taking out the earth and you're getting this Whenever you're digging, you're digging something and you're taking out the piece of earth that you've dug and you throw it out, right? So similar way, because it is like maybe 10, 15,000 feet deep wells. So there is a fluid that you pump through the well and it takes out all the cuttings or the rock that you have already drilled and which comes to the surface. So along with this uh, rocks, also the, the gas, there are there is gas in the pores of these rocks. In US, in, in unconventional shale, there is always gas in the in the rocks. There could be oil in terms of conventional reservoirs, uh, but in shale rocks, so there is gas. Once you break the rock, the gas is also liberated. This gas along with the rocks comes out to the surface when you uh, pump this drilling fluid and get it out. So whenever this drilling fluid comes up, uh, my job is to take the rocks and also we have uh, equipment that extract the gas out of this liquid, which is basically just an agitator. It's a small agitator. So this uh, drilling fluid goes into the agitating chamber. We agitate it. So the gas comes up and then we have a vacuum which sucks the gas and takes it to our uh, analyzing equipment like chromatographs or uh, FIDs or whatever we have. So once we send the gas to all these uh, equipment, we can actually take the split of the gas from C1 to C5, what is what is the PPM of C1, what is the PPM of C2, and so on. And depending on the service and depending on what they pay for, we can detect gases up to C27. And this helps a lot for the operator to know what kind of gas is there downhole and what kind of a reservoir fluid that is. So they know an idea that when they're producing this well, once they have completed drilling the well and once they start flowing it, what what gas to expect so that they can design a production facility based on that to be able to separate this gas 
and uh, what kind of an oil that they can expect from this uh, reservoir so we have already analyzed it while drilling so that it can help them with completing the well and helping produce so that's basically my job so usually it's a, a crew of four people and uh, two people work in the day two people work in the night so the drilling goes on for 24 hours so usually the shift starts at 5:30 in the morning and uh, until 6 pm in the evening and the next shift is from 5:30 pm in the evening till 6 am in the morning so we work 24 hours and you are in if if you are working in oil rigs then it's a very remote locations uh, and sometimes i might have to drive 2 hours one way just to get a glass of milk so that that's the that's the kind of job that i'm doing right now but i'm i really like what i'm doing because it's more hands on and i get to monitor drilling operations in real time so just just more than just knowing a number i know what is the physical significance of this number so this is the thing and that i hope that answered your question uh, about the nature of my work uh yep so i was all, yeah i was talking to you about uh, finally once you get admit from universities it can also be confusing to choose what you want to do what course you want to do and what are the next steps so that again comes from within you need to be able to decide what what is it that you want from this course what is it that you want to take take back from this course work so depending on that you you choose the university sometimes even the location of this university matters say if you're doing chemical engineering from a university where there are no chemical industries then you might not have a very good exposure in terms of your course work so that that was one of the reasons why i chose university of houston because every oil company is there in houston and you cannot get more exposure than this uh, in the us at least so that location also matters and plus financials the i i had admit from some universities which might have been better ranked than university of houston but the fees was like too high and i might end up spending like 70 80 lakhs on the coursework alone which i was sure that i'm not going to do and that was the reason like you need to be able to compare all of these it just doesn't depend on the course or the location it also depends on the financials and what you're able to do sometimes it also depends on the cost of living in the place so if you're going to a place like california or new york you're going to spend a lot of money on uh, your living and living expenses basically so that also depends but a place like houston or even somewhere in missouri or some other place it might be lesser so you need to take into account all this and then choose what course you want so once you have chosen the course you need to be able to talk to professors you have to network with people the main thing that another thing that maitri had uh, told in yesterday's talk was create a linkedin profile please and you need to network with people do not feel shy or uh, don't think that okay maybe you're not good enough to talk to someone or ask for any favors if someone is willing to help you always take that help and on linkedin you need to be able to uh, network with a lot of people you can also network with professors from your college that if you have already had an admit from a college you have decided to accept this admit you can network with professors you can send them emails to talk about stuff that you have done in your undergrad and you can also express your interest that you want to work with them or something like that who knows it might even open up a door for your uh, for a scholarship or a research assistantship or teaching assistantship so always try to do this beforehand this was another thing that i did not do uh, i i i was to i don't know it was a mind block or what i i thought maybe it's not the right thing like to contact a professor and find out beforehand i just wanted to get to the university and then talk to someone but you can always do this online and if you get it it's it's a good thing if you can if you're able to get a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship before even you start your coursework so that takes off a lot of burden on you financially and and mentally so this is one thing that uh, i wish i had done i wish i had talked to some professors talked to more seniors talked to more alumni from the same college so if you have got an admit always try to connect with alumni from the same college who have done the same coursework on linkedin on social anywhere you can even find indian associations every college has an indian association so you can always find that on facebook and network with people always network with people and find out whatever uh, you can how much our information you get is always helpful so that's one thing and once 
you are done with all this process then then there is a visa interview that you need to crack which which is not so hard but yeah just be confident don't stammer and i think that's that's have all your paperwork ready like have everything with you you don't know what they're going to ask you on that day so have everything ready with you when you go for your visa interview i know a few people who got uh, rejected like twice or thrice in their visa interviews but just be confident uh, whenever you talk don't stammer they are not there to eat you up so they are just asking you a question and making sure that you are a genuine guy you are not coming here just to you know be an illegal immigrant or something so you just need to present all your paperwork and be confident so i guess that that is pretty much about the process uh, uh, of of this whole ms and us 101 so if you have any any more questions like you can go ahead i would like to yeah. take more questions so in just so that's nice huh? so the 101 it, it reminds me of the uh, <laughs> mit chemical engineering 101 which is the first chemical <laughs> engineering course started 100 years before probably oh, okay the chemical engineering number in mit is 10 so it's not one over they will write 10.1 okay the, the, uh, i mean the okay, 10th program yeah. uh, the 10th program in mit is actually the chemical engineering so if you go and see in the uh, history of chemical engineering they will write 10.1 so okay. of course 10 is chemical engineering actually Good. yep so so we will uh, uh, if anybody has any uh, queries i think we can take it you can unmute and also speak and we'll just oh, yeah. we'll look for two three minutes right so that's uh, quite a lot of things you have told us huh? right from yeah. oh yeah exam so to lot. lor to gre to admission to how many colleges to apply how to study uh, one thing <laughs> you did is uh, you, uh, i think you can uh, tell uh, in us or not just us everywhere outside india i think you have to study on your own you are not to be spoon fed oh, oh yeah so in in your masters course you are not taught you are lectured there is a difference between teaching and lecturing so you are being lectured here that means you are only given information and you need to be able to build on that and do your homework it's not like you are given that this question comes in your exam and you just learn that and come no that will not happen i learned it the hard way that will not happen <laughs> so yeah. and there is no one particular book i had some courses where my professor would be like bring whatever you want to the exam like bring your laptop use internet do whatever you want this is a two <laughs> two hour paper i'll give you four hours i'll buy you food also but you you just answer one question and you might not be able to do it so <laughs> so yeah <laughs> That, so that's that's the kind a, of thing there is a difference between lecturing and teaching so you need to be able to yeah. there so is no means, one book responsible you are also accountable for your own learning oh yeah you are uh, 100% that is you are just given the information it's just presented to you and you need to make all the learning out of it as much as you can so uh, hi and i am uh, harir i just had uh, one person uh, so i was one who asked you regarding the you know job security thing in petroleum industries so i'm currently doing masters of engineering in chemical in australia so my question is uh, if i if i get into a petroleum industry right now so uh, and uh, in the future if if i is there is there a possibility that you know it, uh, i i come out and i i can proceed nowhere else Uh, is it like if i if i get out of an uh, a petroleum industry uh, and i don't find any further job in petroleum industry because the demand is low is it possible mm-hmm. for me to jump to another industry after being in a petroleum industry yeah yeah for sure you can always jump to another industry that's that's where your uh, uh, your bachelor's in chemical helps so yeah uh, you can always jump to another industry so the thing is in petroleum also you try to position yourself now that you're doing your masters in uh, uh say chemical engineering so you might if you get a job in a petroleum company it might more be towards uh, midstream or downstream you are not going to get into drilling and exploration which is uh, upstream so even if you are able to get out from any midstream job or downstream job you can still apply to any other industry because the process is kind of the same you have worked in a process industry so it's it's kind of the same you can always move 
and i mean try to develop skills like management skills or some other skills whenever you are don't uh, don't stagnate yourself try to develop some skills whenever you are there in any industry so that you you are more uh, flexible to move to another industry whenever you get a chance or if it comes to it that you don't have a job in petroleum uh, something like yeah. that so I, i yeah i hope that helps yeah okay thank you so much na yeah no problem any other questions or hello yes sir yeah sorry i got disconnected my net had a issue okay yeah. i saw your message so good <laughs> so good so in abroad uh, you are accountable uh, and responsible and liable also for your learning for learning and for everything no one is going to cook food for you you have to do it yourself good or bad so, you have to eat it so <laughs> you have to take care of your finances it makes you independent yeah. in every way so that's a good thing yeah so that's a huge contrast from how we uh, do here to what uh, here so that's something i think uh, people who want masters should tune themselves at least yeah and also another thing they should be open to interacting with uh, people from every country like what i see is like when we come we just want to even you come to the us and the first thing you want to do is go to an indian restaurant or you want to talk to indian people i'm not saying that's wrong but always try to be open about interacting with every other people you have an opportunity here that people from every country are there and you need to be able to make the most out of it so don't restrict yourself that i'll only talk to uh, indians or only interact with this keep your social group wide so you learn a lot of things about pe- from people from different countries too so that that's another thing yeah okay so i think uh, we will end here it's uh, it's a long and i think people can get back to you so who is uh, maybe who is going to summarize of what our uh, today's effect probably shrikar shrikar are you there shrikar shrikar are you able to listen Yeah, Shrikar, you can summarize, or I mean, like you can make the closing remarks of what you have heard. You can unmute. Yeah, you need to talk. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you need to unmute and then talk or summarize. That's what I'm saying. not on the chat window how much time shrikar let's <laughs> unmute <laughs> acha now only uh, transmission delay yes <laughs> uh. Yeah, Shrikar. Microphone is blocked, sir. Okay. What about Hariharan? Final year. I'm not talking about uh, Australian Hariharan. Okay. So I'll come back. Hariharan, are you able to? Sir. Yeah, Shrikar. Yeah, yeah Shrikar is able to talk now. Yeah, Shrikar. Yeah, go proceed. uh oh, okay thanks a lot uh, for the valuable information you given to us so basically uh once uh ana stole uh, how we have to face ourselves before going to there what mind should we make up uh it's not like you go to us you settle down there you live a rich life uh it is where uh, there are a lot of pros and cons of going there and uh the main thing one might face is the variability in the immigration issue, immigration policies uh and it all starts from writing you know choosing between gre and gate and it's a whole new different path from gre you go there and you have to work out your way through the process you have to choose your subject and choose your professor and uh, after so he has taught us before graduating 
out of the masters uh, we have to we have to decide what we should do what we should know before graduating uh, what do you want to do before graduating of the masters so so like uh, uh, the graduate and do something so it's not that way so uh, thanks a lot anna for giving your work experience and describing your upstream process uh, and that all right uh, thank Hello. you yeah shrikar yeah thank you so i'll just take one more comment uh, probably i will pick this is akash raman akash raman uh, is uh, your junior but uh, mm -hmm. he has a strange experience of he was there for his sap at new york and now he is okay. in netherlands so he has okay. crossed both the sides of atlantic yeah nice. akash 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 are you able to hear akash so much yeah akash you can yeah akash you can have your summarization yeah akash proceed yeah so i think it was very relatable uh, some of the issues that uh, sundar mentioned but they were quite similar to what i faced also uh, when i was applying for universities for instance for phd or yeah and, uh, i think i think he gave a very good overall uh, overall uh, uh set of guidelines that you, you that students can follow down the line when they are choosing uh, universities for instance that's that's quite quite crucial and in fact i also made that same mistake because i al almost all of my universities uh, were quite ambitious uh despite the gre score and despite the experience and whatnot but it's very important to choose also uh the right universities and i think sundar had uh, had those points uh locked down really well so yeah thanks sundar no problem thank you so and also like you can take my uh, contact details from narin sir any time and uh, yeah. whatsapp is like a very convenient way to reach out to me i usually respond very soon uh, maximum one day if i am at work if i am at places where i don't have internet but yeah i usually respond soon so if you have any questions anything that you might think is too stupid or too silly whatever it is go ahead and ask i i don't mind i'll answer them so right so thank you sundar so that is nice uh, i hope uh, this will help a lot of third years and second years and the forthcoming batches uh, in their journey of masters in higher education so thank you all uh, we will host uh, this uh, video again on youtube and uh, whoever is not able to join can actually join and i will share the details of uh, sundar whomever wants to reach him thank you all i'm just stopping the recording